is Andrea Kane, and I'm here with you with HSC 114, Medical Terminology, where we are studying the Language of Medicine, 12th edition by Davy Ellen Chabner. We are now on Chapter 17. We're looking at the sense organs of the eye and the ear. We just finished Chapter 16, which was on the skin or integumentary system. And this is the second video for Chapter, I'm sorry, for Week 12. Um, there were two, chapter 16 and now chapter 17, and this is chapter 17. We will be focusing on unit objectives 9.13.1 through 9.13.8 if you are looking at your syllabus. And we will also be covering these chapter goals of looking at the locations and functions of the major parts of the eye and the ear. We'll go through the combining forms, prefixes, and suffixes most commonly used to describe these organs and their parts. Describe the abnormal conditions that may affect the eye and the ear. Talk about clinical procedures that pertain to the fields of ophthalmology and otology. And then apply our knowledge to understanding medical terms in their proper contexts. So if you want to follow along in your textbook, we are on page 649 and moving into page 650. So how do we start this off talking about senses? Well, a stimulus is applied to the receptor cells in our ear and eye. Those excite nerve, fi nerve fibers that carry impulses to our brains, where those nerve impulses are then translated into sound sensations and visual images. How cool is that? When you think about this, so it starts with some type of stimulus. It goes through these receptors. It excites nerve fibers that carry these impulses to the brain where the brain translates them, turns them into what we see in here. So let's talk about the eye because that's the first part that we're going to look at. These are the four parts of your eye that you really need to know. Your sclera, your pupil, your iris, and your eyelid. We'll talk um, a lot about those. I mean, we will get into some of the other things that can happen, but these are the initial ones. But now we need to get beyond looking straight at the eye, sort of like this path of light, and figure out what else is going on. So let's go, it, let's go in order. Item number one is the pupil. So the pupil of the eye is this gray part here, right here in front. Then we can talk about the conjunctiva, and that's this, this white layer here that can come down over the eye. It's underneath the eyelid. Then you have your cornea. That's this outer layer here. Then, whoops, I keep going backwards, don't mean to do that. Then you've got underneath, so you've got your conjunctiva. Then you've got your cornea. Now we're going to talk about your sclera, which is this white portion here, this white piece here, sclera. Then you've got this, this pink area in here, that's your choroid, choroid. Your iris, your ciliary body, the lens, the lens, anterior chamber, that's this part up front, anterior chamber. And then we're going to move toward the back of the eye. And this is where we get into what's called the vitreous humor. It's this jelly-like area right behind the lens. And you can see inside the vitreous humor, you've got blood vessels. Then here is your retina. It's in the back of your eye. And your retina is where you want your images to refract to. And then after your retina, you've got your optic nerve over here, and that's the bundle of nerves that are going to carry those impulses to the brain for translation. Then you've got your optic disc back in here. Your macula, 
right in here. And then there's an area right in the middle of the macula called the fovea centralis. So all those ana anatomical um, terms, which are also medical terms. These are the ones you're going to want to make sure you know. Pupil, conjunctiva, cornea, sclera, choroid, iris, ciliary body, lens, fundus, anterior chamber, aqueous humor, vitreous chamber, vitreous humor, retina, optic nerve, optic disc, macula, and fovea centralis. How does vision work? Well, you have two visual fields. You have a left and a right. And in each eye, the left side of each eye goes to the right visual field, and the right side of each eye goes to the left visual field. And those, um, those, those, those get translated through these optic nerve fibers here. You can see them right in here. These are optic nerve fibers. They come to the optic chiasm, and the optic chiasm, whoops, sorry, my, my mouse gets a little overexcited sometimes. I apologize. Um, the optic chiasm is here in the middle, and that's where the, the right visual field stimuli go to the left side of the brain in the left visual cerebral cortex, and where the right side of the eye, which sees the left visual field, will move over here to the right side of the brain in the right visual cerebral cortex. Lost my mouse again. I apologize. Back here, little mouse. It has run away again. If it's not misbehaving, it's just gone hiding. All right, so notice here you have your thalamus, and your thalamus is considered your relay center. So make sure that you're aware of that. And the cerebral cortex of your brain is in the occipital lobe. So that's important knowledge to have. All right. Pop quiz, what is the soft jelly-like material behind the lens in the vitreous chamber that helps maintain the shape of the eyeball? We just covered this. We just, just covered this. Hopefully you remember what it is. Vocabulary then, accommodation, anterior chamber, aqueous humor, biconvex, choroid, ciliary body, cone, conjunctiva, cornea, Fovea centralis, fundus of the eye, iris, lens, macula, optic chiasm, optic nerve, optic disc, optic nerve, pupil, refraction, retina, rod, sclera, thalamus, vitreous humor. Those are all vocabulary words you're going to need to know for your quiz, so study up. Now we're on to combining forms, and our equation is root plus combining vowel equals combining form. Aqueo, blepharo, conjunctivo, coro, corneo, cyclo. Dacro, iro, irido, kerato, lacrimo, oculo. And I'm going to pause here for a minute because there's a couple things I want to point out to you. First thing is, Notice that there are two combining forms for iris and two that can mean tears. Just wanted to point that out for you for your study. Ophthalmo, opto, optico. Look at that, all those for eyes. And actually, I think if we went backward, did we go backward? Nope, I went up, sorry. Yes, oculo starts with I. And then you've got ophthalmo, opto, and optico. Although watch out for opto and optico because those can also mean vision. Palpebro means eyelid, but so did blepharo. So again, another one to watch out. Papillo is optic disc. Phaco is lens of the eye. I want to bring papillo to your attention because as we go to the next page, notice that we have pupillo. There's one letter difference between these two, between papillo and pupillo, but they mean totally different things. Phaco, 
was lens of the eye, but also notice FACO with a C was lens of the eye. So watch out for that one too. Retino, sclero, uvio, and vitreo. Ambolo, ambolo, diplo, glauco, myo, mydro, nicto. Photo, prespo, scato, zero. Now some suffixes, opia, opsia, both mean vision, and tropia. Which term means inflammation of the eyelid? I know you can get this one. Look for the suffix that means inflammation. Now look at the combining form. Which one of those means eyelid? Only one. There's only one that means eyelid. All right. What can happen when your eyes don't refract light the way that they should? Well, excuse me. Well, there's something that can go wrong. There's four things. And we're going to study really the first three things on the next page, but I want to just go through them here really quickly. Astigmatism is where the curvature of the cornea or lens of the eye causes you to see things that aren't in focus. Hyperopia means farsightedness. Myopia means nearsightedness. Presbyopia means that your vision is worsening due to old age. It has to do with how your lens is accommodating the light. So let's take a look at this visual here. On the right hand side, you will see the corrected vision when they have the appropriate lens. So, okay, you can see those, the lenses and they're different shapes. But what I want to draw your attention to is where the two lines of vision cross. On the right hand side, they all cross in the same place once they've been corrected. You notice that? They, they cross right in front of the retina. On the left hand side with astigmatism, they cross way too early. So by the time they cross, they're way, they're, they're already crossed before they ever get to the retina. And that's why it's blurry. With hyperopia, farsightedness, it wants to cross after the eye. It, it's trying to cross way after the eye. It can't bring it into focus. And so um, the correction is to bring it up to the retina instead of having them cross behind the retina where there is no eye. Um, myopia, on the other hand, is sort of like astigmatism in that they cross too early. But they don't cross nearly as early as they do in astigmatism. But in um, myopia, they're crossing too early and so by the time they get to the retina, there's not that appropriate focus. So what they're trying to do with all of these is use the correct type of convex or concave lens to refract the light so that the vision is able to focus right in front of the retina where it's supposed to be. And so that's what they're trying to show you with, with this slide. Well, cataracts, let's talk about cataracts because that is an abnormal condition. Cataract typically happens with age, although not always with age. And if you're wondering where I'm at on your, um, in the book, if you were following with the book, I am on page 662, top of page 662. This is where the lens gets clouded, so there's decreased vision. And there's different types of procedures that they can do to, to um, fix this. Calasian is a small, hard cystic mass on the eyelid. It's a result of chronic inflammation of a sebaceous gland along the margin of the eyelid. It just has too much sebum in there, and it just causes sort of like a pimple. Diabetic retinopathy. When we talked about diabetes um, two weeks ago, we were on the endocrine chapter and we talked a little bit about it. We did mention that retinop retinopathy, sorry about that, um, is one of those unfortunate side effects of the progression of diabetes. It affects the eye, how the retina works. And some of the ways it does that is through microaneurysms, hemorrhages, dilation of the retinal veins, or what's called neovascularization. And so 
People with diabetic retinopathy typically are required to have an eye exam every two years and some every year. And the reason is they're looking for these and they're looking to see is their vision better, the same or worse. And they, they are hoping that it stays the same, that it doesn't progress. Um, there's a few things that can be done for diabetic retinopathy, but if it progresses too far, it can end in blindness. Glaucoma. Glaucoma is increased intraocular pressure that damages the retina and the optic nerve. So you can think about, okay, you've got nerves that are going to the brain and they're carrying these messages or these, these yeah, these messages that are going to get turned into images. And if you've got increased pressure, what is that doing? And that can cause um, loss of vision. It's the, what your book, your book explains it better than I can. But anyway, interocular pressure is elevated because the inability of the aqueous humor to drain from the eye and enter into the bloodstream. Normally the aqueous humor is formed by the ciliary body, flows into the anterior chamber and leaves the eye at the angle where the cornea and iris meet. If the fluid cannot leave or too much fluid is produced, that pressure builds up in the anterior chamber. And how they diagnose this is doing a procedure called tonometry. And that's where they, um, they, they do some local anesthetic and then they put an instrument and then they measure it. But anyway, your book talks about glaucoma and that's that I would just encourage you to read that. And that's the top of page 663. Other abnormal conditions include, um, a staph infection of a sebaceous gland in the eyelid that's also known as a sty or a cordiolum. Um, macular degeneration is a progressive um, damaging um, condition to the macular of the retina. And if you look on page 664, it talks about that. Um, macular degeneration causes blindness. Um, there's no treatment for macular degeneration except trying to slow it down, um, but that's pretty much going to result in blindness. Nystagmus is repetitive rhythmic movements of one or both eyes. If you see somebody who seems to have a blinking problem, um, maybe it's nystagmus. Um, Strabismus is an abnormal deviation of the eye. That's where the, perhaps you're looking at someone and you notice that they have one eye looking at you and one eye looking away. Normally both eyes work together. They work in tandem and they're doing the same thing at the same time. When you have one eye that's going off on its own, doing its own thing, that's strabismus. And um, sometimes that can be corrected as well. Retinal detachment is another abnormal condition. This is, you have two layers on your retina and when they get separated from each other, that's called retinal detachment. And the way that you know that you might have retinal detachment is through photopsia or seeing floaters. Um, bright flashes of light, sort of like, sort of like fireworks, or you see these floaters, these big clumps of stuff that are floating through. If you have either one of those, you definitely want to get to an eye doctor and see if you've got retinal detachment. There's a couple procedures they can do with that. They can do what's called a scleral buckle, or they can do a pneumatic retinopexy. Um, and you can read about those also in your book on page 665. What types of diagnostic procedures are done on the eye? Well, there's lots of things that they can do with the eye these days. There's fluorescein angiography, where they inject, inject a dye in to see the blood flow through the retina. There's also, if you've ever gone and had your eyes checked, if you've ever had your eyes dilated and then looked at very, very closely, that is using an ophthalmoscope to do that visual examination when your eye is dilated. Ophthalmoscopy is what the term is. Slit lamp microscopy is where it's a magnified view 
looking at eye structures. This is where they're really getting in there and looking at the individual structures and to make sure that there's no, no types of damage or um, any type of um, progression that shouldn't be there. I think most all of us have had a visual acuity test of some sort to assess our clarity of vision from a certain number of feet away. Visual field test is when they have you look straight forward and then they look to see what can you see above, below, and side, and on either side. They want to measure those visual fields. What are some treatments? Well, the first one is something you hope never ever happens to anyone. That's called enucleation, where they remove the entire eyeball. Hopefully that, that is a last, last option ever, ever done. Um, but sometimes, unfortunately, people do need to have that kind of surgery, maybe if they've had a severe trauma. There's also laser photocoagulation. This is where they use an argon laser, and it creates an inflammatory reaction that seals retinal tears and leaky blood vessels. And then you may have heard of LASIK. LASIK is a laser procedure that corrects errors of refraction by sculpting the cornea. It's amazing to think about how um, someone can take a laser, they can sculpt someone's cornea, and it can correct their vision. But it's true, LASIK has been around for quite a number of years now. Keratoplasty, this is a surgical repair of the cornea, if something has happened to the cornea. Scleral buckle, we talked a little bit about when we were talking about retinal detachment. And that's where they suture a silicone band to the sclera over that detached portion of the retina to get those two layers back together again. Phacal emulsification is an ultrasound that's used to break up the lens for aspiration of a cataract. Um, and then they can remove the pieces. Vitrectomy, that's removal of the vitreous and replacing it with a clear solution. Sometimes that's also a part of these types of procedures if it's needed. Abbreviations, here's more. Make sure that you know, um, excuse me, OD, OS, and OU. Those three are very, very common when it comes to the eye. OD, OS, and OU. Perla is another one to really know when you're in the medical field because you'll see PERLA on, on a lot of things, whether it's an electronic record or a paper form, it means pupils equal round reactive to light and accommodation. All right, now we are on to the ear. So let's talk about the ear. The outer ear receives sound waves and these sound waves travel to the middle ear and then the vibrations then reach the inner ear, which is also known as the labyrinth. And what parts of the ear do we need to know? Well, there's the pinna or auricle, external auditory meatus or auditory canal, tympanic membrane, also known as your eardrum, malleus, incus, stapes, oval window, eustachian tube, cochlea, auditory nerve fibers, vest vestibule, and semicircular canals. If you are in your book, we are now up to page 670. So if you're wondering where we're at, that's where we are. And this is a good visual to show us the different parts of the ear. My mouse is not working, so um, you're just going to have to follow along. I'll call out the numbers and you can follow with me. Number one is the pinna or oracle. And that's just our outer ear, the ear, ear itself. Two is the external auditory meatus or the auditory canal. That's where the sound is all sent um, on its way, captured by, the, captured by the pinna and sent through that external auditory meatus. It reaches the tympanic membrane, number three, tympanic membrane or our eardrum. And from there, it goes through the malleus, which is number four, the incus, which is number five, and the stapes which is number six. And the stapes are right there at the oval window. They lead into the oval window. And from there, number eight is the, it, we're gonna jump to the bottom. I wish they would have kept it the same, sorry. 
I think I will keep it the same to so it's not quite so so confusing. So you're at the stapes, which is number six, that leads into the oval or connects into the oval window, number seven, which is all part of that that next piece, which is the cochlea at the end. The snail-like portion is the cochlea. The middle piece with all those little chambers is called the vestibule, vestibule, sorry, vestibule. And then at the top, you see those loops. Those are the semicircular canals. And the semicircular canals, vestibule, and the cochlea, that's all that blue section there on your screen. And then behind the, the so the sound comes in through the ear, through the external auditory meatus. It goes through the tympanic membrane, the malleus inca stapes, the oval window, the semicircular canals, the vestibule, vestibule, sorry, vestibule, and the cochlea. Then it's sent along those auditory nerve fibers, number 10, to the brain. Um, but in the area of the malleus incus and stapes, that leads down into the eustachian tube, eustachian tube. And one of the things I appreciate them pointing out here is the pink areas. So from the pinna, external auditory meatus to the tympanic membrane, that's all considered ex external ear. But once you get to that tympanic membrane, you're starting on middle ear. And the inner ear is the blue. So it just kind of gives you the, the pieces and parts. So we talked about this, the outer ear, oops, and we talked about the middle ear where you pick up at the tympanic membrane and you go all the way through the oval window and the eustachian tube. And then inner ear is the cochlea and the auditory nerve fibers. That wasn't necessarily very clear on that last visual, was it? But anyway, this these last three slides should be helpful. So outer ear is pinna and auditory canal. Middle ear is everything from the tympanic membrane through the eustachian tube, including the oval window. Inner ear is just the cochlea and the auditory nerve fibers leading to the brain. Your balance and equilibrium come from the vestibule and the semicircular canals. So that's why sometimes when somebody has a very severe um, ear infection, they can have difficulty with their balance or they can. Um, feel very dizzy and sick to their stomach because their equilibrium is off, or at least it feels off. So some terms, auditory canal, auditory meatus, auditory nerve fibers, auditory tube, oracle, ceramin, also known as earwax, cochlea, endolymph, eustachian tube. Incus, labyrinth, malleus, organ of corti, ossicle, oval window, perilymph, pinna, semicircular canals, stapes, tympanic membrane, vestibule. Pop quiz, what is the snail-shaped spirally wound tube in the inner ear that contains the hearing-sensitive receptor cells? The hint here is snail-shaped. What part of the ear is snail-shaped? And that will help you answer this. Combining form, acuso, audio, audito, oro, auriculo, cochleo, mastoido, Maringo, Asiculo, Odo, Sapingo, Stapedo, Timano, Vestibulo. Some suffixes, acusus or cusus, that's a new one for us, meaning hearing, meter, and odia. So what are some things that can go wrong with the ear? Sorry, I needed to take a drink. I've been talking a lot today. <clears throat> well, you can have something called an acoustic neuroma. This is a benign tumor that arises from the eighth 
cranial nerve and causes tinnitus, vertigo, dizziness, and decreased hearing. So those um, symptoms, <clears throat> excuse me, typically um, lead doctors to want to investigate to see if there's an acoustic, acoustic neuroma. Cholesteatoma. This is skin cells and cholesterol in a sac in the middle ear. It's a cyst-like mass that is associated with chronic infections. Deafness is a loss of ability to hear. And, and let me back up to deafness really quick. There are a number of ways that deafness can occur. Um, there can be, it can be congenital. There can be some type of, of issue with the ear system when a child is born. It can be something that happens through some type of illness or um, some type of trauma. Um, so there's all sorts of reasons deafness that it can occur. It can, it can be a result of, of um, constant damage with being, for instance, in a noisy environment, a very, very noisy environment for long periods of time. And it can sometimes come with aging. So there are a lot of different ways that um, someone could end up with deafness. Meniere's disease. This is a disorder of the labyrinth with elevated endolymph pressure in the cochlea and semicircular canals that causes tinnitus, sensitivity to sound, progressive hearing loss, headache, nausea, and vertigo. Otitis media. We all know that as inner ear infection or yeah, middle ear infection. Um, so otitis media. That's that good old ear infection. Otosclerosis is a hardening of bony tissue in the labyrinth. Tinnitus is sensation of noises, having that ringing, buzzing, whistling, booming in the ears that just won't go away. Vertigo, this is a sensation of irregular motion, whirling from disease of the inner ear or nerve carrying messages from the semicircular canals. Um, it's like being on a roller coaster in, an, in, in a not good way. <laughs> For those who hate roller coasters, vertigo is like being on a, on a constant roller coaster. It's awful. And for those who love roller coasters, well, um, vertigo is, it definitely doesn't have any of those pleasant feelings if you like roller coasters. So what are some procedures that can be done on the ear system? Well, there's audiometry, and that's an audiometer electric device that's used to determine hearing loss by frequency. And you may have heard of people who are audiologists and they, um, they work with children and adults who are experiencing hearing issues or concerned about maybe they have hearing issues and they do all sorts of testing with that. And audiometry is just one of many hearing tests that they can do. Cochlear implant is a clinical procedure that's a surgery where they implant a device that allows sensorial neural hearing impaired persons to understand speech. Ear thermometry, that's where body temperature is measured with infrared radiation from the eardrum. Otoscopy, that's visual examination of the ear with that small handheld scope. If you've ever been to the doctor's office, they've used a handheld scope. They look in your mouth, at your throat, your eyes, up your nose, and in your ears. Um, when they use it on your ears, it's called otoscopy. Um, there's a tuning fork test. You may, as a child, have seen this where they do hearing tests using a vibrating fork. Um, it's called RIN if the fork is in place against the mastoid bone looking at bone conduction and in front of the auditory meatus for air conduction. It's called Weber if the fork is placed on the center of the forehead and normal hearing has equal loudness in both ears. So there are two types of tuning fork tests. Abbreviations, lots of those. I'm not even sure which ones to tell you to study because all of them um, 
are, are fairly common. Oops. Okay, so combining forms. Remember our equation. It is root plus combining vowel equals combining form. We have acuso, ambolo, aquio, audio, audito, oro, auriculo, blepharo, conjunctivo, coro, corneo, cyclo, dacro, diplo, or diplo, glauco, iro, ir, iridia, Irido, sorry, irido, and notice that there are two there for iris. Carito is cornea. Lacrimo. Mastoido. Myo. Notice myo. This is not, not, not M Y O. It's M I O, meaning totally different things. Mydro is a new one for us. Moringo, nicto, oculo, ophthalmo, opto, optico. Osiculo, palpebro, papilo, phaco, phaco, photo, presbyo, pupillo, retino, salpingo, sclero, salpino. I, I pronounced that wrong, salpino. And watch out because salpingo is different than salpino. So, so make sure that you notice that. There's no G in salpino. Scoto, stipedo, tympano, uvo, uvio, or uvio, vestibulo, vitrio, zero. Now some suffixes. Acusis and cusis both mean hearing. Meter and metri, good old measure and measurement. Opia, opsia, opia and opsia are both vision. Odia, phobia, plegic, tropia. And that is it for ears. Eyes and ears, I guess. That went by quickly. All right, so. That is the end of chapter 17. So for week 12, make sure you watch the video for chapter 16 and this one for chapter 17. And you have your usual discussion. It's on senses and sensibility. There is your weekly assignment on each, cha each chapter as well as your quiz on each chapter. And next week, we will be back to look at chapters 19 and 20 where we're focusing on cancer medicine, also known as oncology, and radiology and nuclear medicine. I hope you have a great week. Stay warm because I think the weather is supposed to turn cold on us finally. Hope you and your loved ones are happy and healthy. Bye. Bye for now. And if only I could get my mouse to move.